Well, welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club this day before the election. We urge you to vote. Your vote is going to be crucial, absolutely crucial. In some of these states, it may be 100 votes. It may be 1,000 votes. It may be 10 votes that could determine the election. So your vote is absolutely important. So whatever you're doing, it's not as important as the fact you've got to cast your ballots. Okay. Now, is a faith in God and a belief in the Bible compatible with true science? Well, we have a gentleman with us who says the answer is yes. He's one of the top astrophysicists and scientists in our nation and in the world. And he's written a book called The Improbable Planet. And uh, his name is Hugh Ross, and he's with us uh, right now. Uh, but look at this at first. Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist who has traveled the world sharing his scientific discoveries that connect science and religion. Through his organization, Reasons to Believe, Dr. Ross, along with a team of scholars, present clear scientific evidence that supports a biblical God. In his new book, Improbable Planet, Dr. Ross shares his testable and reliable biblical creation model that points to a purpose-filled universe. I want to tell you something. I'm the chancellor of Regent University, and I wanted, after I had met Dr. Hugh Ross, to do something on cosm. I, I thought it was cosmogony, and uh, he said it ought to be cosmology. But in any event, we're talking about the cosmos. And I wanted to make sure that in our divinity school, which is one of the largest in the, in the nation, we have about 1,000 students, and I wanted every one of them to have a course in what this man is teaching and his associates. He, he, and so his book is called The Improbable Planet, and it's a great pleasure to welcome a dear friend and a distinguished scientist, Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh, good to have you back with us. Thank you. You've made these incredible statements. This book is fabulous. It's, it's like a devotional. I, I can't tell you, I can't say enough good things about it. It'll move your heart like nothing you ever read. And uh, is it available now? People can buy it? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. It's been out for six weeks now. Six weeks. Is this yeah. selling well, I hope? Very well, yes. All right. Well, let's have more of them. All right. It's called The Improbable Planet, and it's um, available on Amazon and so forth. Okay. You have said, all right, we are in a universe. What is the place of this earth in the universe? Where, where does it sit in relation to everything else? Well, it's on the surface of the universe. Everything's on the surface of the universe, but we're kind of on the edge of a super, super uh, cluster of galaxies. Oh, yeah. We're on the edge of the Virgo super cluster of galaxies. And that is the one place where advanced life is possible. Anywhere else, that wouldn't be the case. Literally, the entire universe must exist. It must be exactly the size that it is, mm -hmm. uh, the mass that it is, and the age that it is to make possible advanced light. The whole universe exists to make planet Earth possible. Well, how many planets like our, our star, I mean, our sun, what, what, what did you say, a billion trillion? 50 billion trillion stars. Wait a minute, 50 billion trillion? Yeah, give or take a few. <laughs> <laughs> 50 billion, and this tiny, it's a teeny, tiny little planet. But all the rest of it exists, so the, this planet, and... Uh, yeah, I, if you want one planet Earth, you need the universe to be exactly as it is. Why? Okay, if you make the universe less massive, yes. the only elements you get are hydrogen and helium. Yes. Make it slightly more massive, all the elements are heavier than iron. In both cases, you're missing the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen that's essential for life. So the mass of the universe determines the chemistry of the universe. But of this huge, you got to have the, all this mass? All this enormous. mass in order to get the elements you need for life, yes. And I understand there was something that scientists believe called the Big Bang, that there was an incredibly dense moment of a little bit of matter, and it, it exploded, and out of that came the universe. Is that the way it was? That is the way it is, but it must be incredibly fine-tuned. Yes. It's not a chaotic explosion. In fact, it's the most fine-tuned thing we can measure in all of science. It's such, and I write about this in the yeah. book, how the fine-tuning of the universe exceeds the best examples of, we can, of what we human beings can design and fine-tune by greater than a factor of 10 trillion, 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 trillion. <laughs> 
trillion, trillion times. Stop it. Come on. You, In other words. You're not just saying that. You, I'm you, not just you, saying it. It's something we can measure. All right. Basically, the God that created the universe must be at least that many times more intelligent, more knowledgeable, creative, and powerful uh, than us human beings. Is there any possibility this came just from a spontaneous explosion? It, it had to have a creator, right? It had to have a creator. Why? And it has to be the creator God of the Bible. There's many other gods and religions of the world, but the universe we measure testifies that it is a God of the Bible. Well, you mentioned a few of those life uh, elements. What else is this improbable planet we live on? Well, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about how we have anomalous elements, mm -hmm. which means that the 92 elements we see on the Earth, for one, we have all 92, which is rare. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at the abundance of those elements compared to what we see on other rocky bodies, we're extremely anomalous. So, for example, uh, we have 340 times as much uranium, uh, 630 times as much thorium. Uh, we are the thorium uranium champions of the universe. Wait, but this one planet? This one planet. Uh, because all the other planets? So the fact that we're so extremely rich in uranium and thorium yeah. explains why we've got the plate tectonics, okay. which allows our small planet to have oceans and continents on its surface. And that allows nutrients to be recycled so advanced life is possible. Without that, at best you could have bacteria and only be able to exist for a short period of time. Well, you know, the unbelievers just are yearning to find life someplace else. But does your scientific uh, inquiry indicate there's anything else like this Earth, any place else in the universe? Everywhere we look, we see hostility for advanced life. Uh, we don't see a galaxy mm -hmm. that's a candidate besides our Milky Way galaxy. We don't see a star that's sufficiently like our sun that it could be a candidate in which a planet could orbit in which advanced life exists. I remember you said that you wrote about this galaxy of ours being hidden uh, in a spiral nebula wh where there's less chaos than others. Could you tell us about that? Well, we live in a, in a spiral galaxy right. with, a, with extremely symmetrical spiral arms. Okay. Uh, the galaxy is exactly the right mass for advanced life, not too big, not too small more dominated by dark matter than other galaxies. It has very few spurs and feathers. There's literally 200 different features mm -hmm. of our Milky Way galaxy that must be fine-tuned to make man's life possible but here on Earth. The Milky Way galaxy is part of this spiral nebula, is that right? The Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy. It is a spiral. That's part of the local group. Oh, okay. And which is a small cluster of galaxies. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's design even in our cluster of galaxies. We don't see another galaxy cluster like ours. And so now we've discovered, I mean, literally, this book arises from a Bible study. I told you it's devotional. You yeah, used that yeah. word yourself. Five years ago, I did a devotional study where I went through the entire Bible mm -hmm. and looked at all the major texts on creation, over 1,500 of them. What I noticed is they all link the doctrine of creation to the doctrine of redemption. Mm -hmm. And I also found passages that say that God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything, which implies that everything that God creates is for the purpose of redeeming billions of human beings. Mm -hmm. Then I did a three-year search of the scientific literature to see if that's really the case. Mm -hmm. And this book basically tells a story of how every event in the history of the universe, Earth and Earth's life, and every component of the universe, Earth, mm -hmm. and Earth's life plays a critical role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings in just thousands of years. And so in the book, I kind of take you through a chronology mm -hmm. of the history of all creation and basically show every bit of it as for the purpose of redemption. What does it look like the destiny of mankind? I mean, here we are again, this planet, you see it out in space, and it's just a tiny little pin drop. Just a little bit. Yes, but if it were any bigger or any smaller, it would be a problem. Okay. Uh, if we had different planets in our solar system, there would be a problem. Every one of the ten planets that originally formed our solar system, there's eight now, mm -hmm. but all ten must be fine-tuned exactly the way they are to make advanced life possible here on Earth. So come Thanksgiving, our family's going to be thanking God for Neptune. We're going to be thanking God for <laughs> Venus. Why, why Neptune? What does Neptune do for us? Well, the four gas giants that remain, there were five to start with. Right. One got kicked out, four remain. Uh, but it's that configuration of the five and now the four 
that makes possible the configuration of the rocky planets, mm -hmm. Earth, Mars, Venus, etc. And unless those eight planets are configured exactly the way they are, you're going to get mean motion resonances, which make, make the system unstable for advanced life. Well, I understand Jupiter is so big, but it, it sucks in all these asteroids. and Yeah, it protects us from protects asteroid and comet collisions. Uh -huh. But you need Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to complement it. Why? Well, it takes the four working together to give us the ideal showering of comets and asteroids. Now, we need some of these asteroids and comets to collide with the Earth. Mm. Um, for example, Earth would have been bone dry if it wasn't for the delivery of water from comets mm -hmm. uh, earlier in its history. Well, uh, we ran, did, did we hit Mars and it spun off the moon? Was, it, was that what that was, a collision between these two planets? There was a, a, a planet called Thea. Thea. that collided with the Earth very early in Earth's history mm -hmm. that led to the formation of the moon. And without the moon, we wouldn't be here. Why? Um, because the, the, the... Well, the fact that we have our, a tiny planet mm -hmm. orbited by a, a single gigantic moon that's not too far away stabilizes the tilt of our rotation axis. Mm -hmm. The other seven planets, they do this. All the time? Yeah, yeah. whereas ours is nice and stable, which gives us a climate... Uh, we get four seasons, and it's a stable uh, climate. That, it, And what I write about in the book, we need extreme climate stability in order for billions of humans to live on the planet one time. And that stability has only existed in the last 9,000 years. The last 9,000? So that, that's, that's when mankind, as we know it, Homo sapiens, really began to flower on the Earth? Well, God created human beings during the last ice age. Uh -huh. And we now have evidence that they were trying to launch agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. But because the temperature is jumping up and down by 24 degrees Fahrenheit, they were unable to sustain large-scale agriculture. Mm -hmm. And what it took was seven different cycles of Earth's orbit and rotation to bring about this period of extreme climate stability starting 9,000 years ago. Uh -huh. And that's what enabled us to have large scale agriculture so we could grow enough food to feed billions of human beings. What do you think this planet can sustain, do we know? That yeah, period people? of extreme climate stability can be sustained for a maximum of maybe 1,400 more years, and it could be as little as 100. And that's it? That's it, so it's going to end. But the story I conclude with in the, in, at the end of the chapter, we're really close to fulfilling the Great Commission. And the promise we have in Romans is the moment that Great Commission is fulfilled, mm -hmm. God's going to replace the current creation with a brand new creation. And so I'm hoping as people read the book, Christians yeah. who read the book will be motivated. Hey, we can get this job done quickly. Well, end with a fervent heat. Is that is going to is going to the universe will disappear with a fervent heat. It'll be rolled up like a scroll. There's actually a model in cosmology that's consistent with that. Um, and then, but the whole point is, God created this universe as a tool to eliminate evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, once that's achieved, we have the promise of a brand new creation. I am so thrilled. You know, I talk to you and I'm, my spirit just takes off. And I, I'm not all that emotional, but this book, The Improbable Planet, you need to get a copy. Now, the thing that is important I want to mention is that you, God bless you, have agreed to help us at Regent University have a course in this. And I want every single theological student, we've got a, a, a thousand divinity students, and hopefully it'll go to two or three thousand. I want every one of them to take this course in cosmology. What are we going to teach them? Well, God gave us two revelations, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Mm -hmm. We're commanded to study both. Because right. the book of nature is a way we can bring unbelievers to the book of scripture. And when I describe in this book, Improbable Planet, this redemptive key gives us a new way, a more efficient way of mm -hmm. interpreting the book of nature. Now, I'm speaking to secular scientists saying this is a better way to advance scientific research. Mm -hmm. Interpret the book of nature in the context of redemption. And we're going to make much faster scientific progress. You know, there's been a little struggle, and I, I don't want to put down any of our brethren, but the idea of the old earth and the, uh, you know, young earth and so forth, that this earth is only 6,000 years old and so forth because of adding up ushers, dating in the Bible. What do you say about all that? Well, uh, we stress integration at Reasons to Believe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not enough to try to interpret the Bible from one book. It's 66 books. 
All right. So we need to read the Bible both literally and consistently. Mm -hmm. So before drawing a conclusion, what are all 66 books say? Likewise with science. You need to look at all the scientific disciplines before you draw a conclusion. Because what God reveals is truth and nothing but truth. It can't contradict. Yeah. And when you see a contradiction, you know you've made a mistake in integrating. So, but the Big Bang, it looks like 14... 13.79 billion years ago. 13.97, 14 billion years, yeah. okay. And there's not 6,000 years, but that, that, that's what all the geology... And well, humanity is recent, but the Earth and the universe have been here right. for a long time. This book tells a story of how God used the whole age of the Earth, mm -hmm. the age of the universe, to open up this tiny window in which billions of us can be redeemed, not in millions of years, but only thousands of years. A great commission. What a wonderful... Listen, the improbable planets you needed. Dr. Hugh Ross is here. And let me tell you, Regent University is so blessed that they can have a man of his caliber to assist in teaching young people, uh, young ministers, the truth of what's going on in our world. That's all the time we've got. But Hugh, God bless you, man. You're an inspiration. Thank you.